sword and shield Down by the riverside Down by the riverside Down by the riverside I'm gonna lay down my sword and shield Down by the riverside Down by the riverside Well, good evening and welcome everyone. We hope that you enjoyed that music as you joined. That is from the Principia college jazz band playing down by the riverside which was one of the songs that was referenced in the book so it was so fun to get to feature them this evening it is wonderful to see you all we love doing these zoom meetings so that we get to see your faces and fun to see so many familiar friends and new friends and we're just thrilled that you have joined us for our final event as part of summer session 2021 I'm Marilyn McFarland and the Senior Director of Alumni and Field Relations. We are missing being with each of you and Elsa this year for summer session, but are grateful we could zoom in together to expand our summer session family to include alumni and friends of Principia from all around the world. We'd love for you to now enter into the chat box where you're joining us from. I know I see some folks from Arizona and California and the East Coast. Throughout this month, we've had people zoom in from all across the United States, Canada, South Africa, France, the Bahamas, the UK, and many other places. We are so grateful for our global Principia family. Whether you've att attended summer session on the Principia College campus in Elsa for over 40 years, one year, or this is your first summer session experience, we have been so grateful for everybody zooming in for these last three weeks of online seminars that were filled with enrichment, community, and fun. So thank you so much for being here with us. We hope that you've enjoyed the summer session seminars this month, covering topics from Bible to Beethoven, history to art. And if you missed one of them, don't worry, they are all recorded and available on our virtual events webpage. We'll put that link in the chat box. Now, our next event you can do right from your home and you don't need to zoom in for it. It is starting on Wednesday, the Alumni and Field Relations Office is hosting the Principia Pie Bake Off. Nothing says July better than a slice of pie. And we're inviting our alumni and friends from around the world from July 1st to the 5th to send us photos and videos of your flavorful creation. I got a head start. So here's my slice of pie and my Principia spatula. I don't know if you can see it. Um, so I will be enjoying the slice of pie this evening. But you can tag us if you post your photos or videos on social media. You can take Principia alumni or email field at principia.edu and I'll throw that in the chat box. We had so much fun doing this last year that our team just thought we have to do it again this year. There will be prizes and you can be as creative as you want and no one from our team will be tasting it. So it doesn't matter how it tastes, but we just look forward to hearing about the amazing creations you make. So share up your favorite, your favorite pies. We can't wait to see what you serve up. Today's talk is being led by longtime lifelong learning faculty member, Linda Conradi. Linda is joining us today from her home in Duluth, Minnesota, where she lives near the shores of Lake Superior. Linda is an avid reader, usually reading about one book a week and is always looking for the next great discussion book. For several years, Linda has conducted a course entitled Hooked on Books at Summer Session, and she hosted book talks on the Principia Lifelong Learning Cruise from Montreal to New York a few years ago. We are so grateful for the book talks that she has given over Zoom this past year and are delighted that she's a part of our summer session online. We encourage you to submit any questions or insights that you have from reading the book in the chat box. My colleague from the Alumni and Field Relations team, Annabelle Lyons, will help to moderate the chat box and ask those questions that you have or share your insights. Following Linda's sharing today, we will have time for each of you to share your insights in breakout rooms. And if you haven't had a chance to read the book yet, please stay, stick around and join those breakout rooms, hear what people have to share about the book. And we always love to hear what you're currently reading and what, what we should choose as our next book club pick. So Linda, we're so grateful that you are here with us today and for your time today. And I will now turn it over to you. 
Thank you, Marilee. Well, welcome everyone. Wasn't that a great musical um, entree? It made me feel like uh, getting up and just dancing around, but I refrained and stayed in my chair. Um, I don't know, I think Marilee didn't mention that that is a recording of the uh, Principia Jazz Band playing that song. And it's one of the songs that is mentioned in the book. So uh, what, a what a lovely start we have to taking our adventure down the river tonight. So thank you. <clears throat> thank you all for joining us for this journey by canoe in the summer of 1932. In the prologue to this tender land, oh, uh, excuse me just a minute. I don't have the, um, the slides. There we go. <clears throat> well, in the prologue to this tender land, author William Kent Kruger gives readers a thumbnail sketch of what to expect in this story. And I'm, go I'm going to quote because it's just, it's just a wonderful um, roadmap for us. He says, <clears throat> the tale I'm going to tell is of a summer long ago of killing and kidnapping and children pursued by demons of a thousand names. There will be courage in this story and cowardice. There will be love and betrayal. And of course, there will be hope. In the end, isn't that what every good story is about? So he's given us a wonderful blueprint of what to expect when we read the story. But before we get into it, I'd like, you to in, I'd like to introduce you to the author. This is a picture of William Kent Kruger, who goes by Kent. He's a resident of St. Paul, Minnesota. And for many years, he has risen early in the morning to go to a coffee shop where he writes. And he's written many of his books from the coffee shop. He's a disciplined and prolific writer and about to publish his 18th mystery in his Cork O'Connor series. Now, this book, this, this Tender Land is a standalone, but he has written a wonderful mystery series over the years um, that many of us have, have followed quite avidly. His standalone novel, Ordinary Grace, like this tender land is also set in Southern Minnesota. Um, if you look at uh, YouTube, you can find many fascinating interviews and um, conversations, a lot, of, a lot of information and discussion um, with him posted on YouTube. Also his own website has um, just a wealth of background information and questions for discussion groups. Um, he tells a lot about the writing of the, of the book itself. So I urge you, if you um, have not had a discussion with your own book group, um, to check out some of these resources because it's wonderful background. Um, he, he tells us that this particular book was inspired by reading good literature in his youth, including Mark Twain's Tom Sawyer and also Huck Finn and the writings of Homer Charles Dickens and Ernest Hemingway. In this story, our narrator nicknamed Odie is actually named Odysseus after the hero of Homer's The Odyssey, a story about one man's long and challenging journey home. If you have read The Odyssey, you will enjoy discovering parallels in the construction of this story. This tender land, Kruger says, is the book he has always wanted to write. He is a compelling and gifted storyteller. This slide is an artist rendition of where this journey takes place. And um, it, it, it really is an artist rendition, of course, starting up at, near the top in Minnesota where you see the red mark and then the line going past the Lincoln School and down down the river and it shows Gertie's and then on down the Mississippi to St. Louis, Missouri. Gertie's is actually in Minnesota, but um, I think perhaps the artist wanted us to just have a few of the um, important landmarks along the way. This next slide is an actual map of Minnesota. 
and along the um, southwestern corner, you have the Minnesota River where they spent quite a bit of time. They, they started out in the Gilead, which is a small river and it flows into the Minnesota River. But then the Minnesota River takes a sharp turn north at Mankato and goes on to St. Paul. And St. Paul is where we meet Gertie and we are at the flats, which we're going to be talking about. But that's where the, uh, the Minnesota and the Mississippi converge. There's a confluence of the two rivers. So the next, the next slide shows, um, this is Fort Snelling, which was built high on a bluff, dominating the confluence of the Minnesota and Mississippi rivers. And it was from this um, army garrison that soldiers were dispatched to quell the uprising of the Dakota in the Minnesota River Valley. And of course, we have um, quite a bit in our story about um, Native Americans, particularly one of the boys named Mose, who, who was one of the four orphans going down the river. But um, this is now, I believe it's a state park. And if you're doing any touring in Minnesota, it's, it's a really fascinating place to go. The next slide shows a school that was the ins part of the inspiration for um, Kruger's research, Pipestone Indian Training School. And this was, this was his inspiration for the Lincoln Indian Training School where our story begins. But it looks a little bit bleak. Um, he, Kruger, Kruger um, did a lot of his research in the Minnesota Historical Society. And so these next few slides you will see um, are, are from his research and from his website. Um, you can go back just a second to, the, to that one. Um, our story begins in Southwest Minnesota in Fremont County at the Lincoln Indian Training School where Native American children were forcibly sent to be educated. It's one of the many such schools where children were supposed to leave behind their native heritage and acquire ways of the white culture. The experience was frightening, traumatic and fraught with abuse of all sorts. Our narrator, Odie, and his brother, Albert, are the only white children in the school. And further on in the story, we learn why they are there. Okay, now we can go to the next one, thank you. Um, these next few slides show what it was like to be living through the Great Depression in the heartland. Um, people lost their jobs, they lost their homes. This is a, a picture of um, a farm foreclosure in 1938. And um, it was an all too common occurrence during the Great Depression. Very, very sad. Okay, the, next, um, the next slide shows um, one of the encampments or, or villages that popped up uh, many times along the river and in different cities. And they were called Hoovervilles. But the one that we become acquainted with in our story where Odie meets the, the love of his life at age 13, um, the people there renamed it Hoperville. They were, they were nothing more than tar paper and cardboard shacks. And yet the people in that particular little village lived with hope. And so I love the way they called, they called their little town um, Hoperville. And, and it was a time when there were a lot of hobos riding the rails. Um, when, Kruger, when Kruger included along his theme, the theme of hope, I think it buoys all of us up as readers because the times in which they were living were pretty depressing. Then we had tent revivals. Oh, I'm sorry. First, we had first we had the Dust Bowl occurring in 1936, and some of you have read some other novels where where we have the terrible, terrible effects of the Dust Bowl, and um, again, just kind of a graphic sense of the background of the times in which this book is set. 
then then the the tent revivals and we're going to um, stay on this slide for a while I have I have um, a couple of different things I want to talk about but this 1920s tent revival meeting was not unlike those of Sister Eve's Sword of Gideon healing crusade and uh, those of you who who read the book became very familiar with their moving around the country and having these crusades. Um, but we also learn that many of the people who attend Sister Eve's revivals are not there for the spiritual or healing effects, but for the soup and bread meal served after the service. And so I, I think that, um, you know, we can give a nod to Sister Eve and her group for also meeting some of the human needs of the people in addition to to wanting to help heal and um, uplift them spiritually. But to go, to go back to what um, we were promised by Kruger, one of the things she says that this story is going to be about killing and kidnapping and children pursued by, by demons of a thousand names. So the first few chapters of this book may be challenging to read as we learn about the cruel and unjust punishment dealt to children for any and no reason. They were given solitude in the quiet room without meals and beatings and other abuse by DeMarco, a man feared by all of the children. Superintendent Thelma Brickman singles out Odie more than others for such treatment. She even takes his harmonica from him the one possession that gives him comfort when he plays it. Rebellious, Odie is the opposite of his older brother, Albert. Usually, Albert is able to talk sense into Odie, but not always. And Albert has secrets of his own, as you learn. Of course, Kruger says we will also meet courage and cowardice. And we see both in this story. But somehow the tough times are buoyed by the bond of family and brotherhood before orphans exhibit. There is also fear and trust, risk taking, and just plain hope that their goal of finding family in St. Louis is realized. As we follow the four vagabonds down the river, fleeing the law and Thelma Brickman, we see their resourcefulness and care for one another. Little six-year-old Emmy, orphaned by a tornado, is bundled into the canoe with the three older boys and is comforted by, and also comforts her traveling companions as they make their way down the river toward St. Louis. Mose, the only Native American in the group, can only communicate through sign language. Since as a young child, his tongue was cut out, and he was left to die with his mother beside a road. Albert and Odie's mother had been deaf, and so they knew sign language in which they communicated with Mose, and Emmy could speak Mose's native language. They were all able to communicate with one another. Somehow, there are threads of help and hope woven throughout the story, and there are stories within stories too complex to go into their details in this brief talk, but worth pondering as you read. And then Kruger tells us that we will meet love and betrayal. So as I mentioned, we glimpse Odie's awakening to love at the tender age of 13, when he meets Maybeth Schofield uh, in Hoperville, Hoperville. We see Sister Eve's love for Emmy, and the bond of love in the created family of the four orphans is the whisper of hope that permeates the hardships they endure. It is hope, says Kruger. That is what every good story is about. Hope is an elusive quality to define, but poet Emily Dickinson may have captured its essence when she wrote in this poem, hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tunes without the words and never stops at all. 
but then while we have the tent revival uh, that we're looking at right now, it's probably a good time to address what I call the God question. Perhaps best link to hope is the thread of spirituality that runs through this story. Early in the story, we are introduced to Odie's concept of God. He says that God is a tornado, basically bringing death and destruction and all things evil. Thelma Brickman, whom the children call the Black Witch, is one such example. DeMarco is another in the way he abuses children. It is easy to see how Odie views life through this lens when he's at that school. Yet, there is in good, a goodness in Odie that is evident in his loyalty to Albert, Mose, and Emmy. He trusts Volz, the one adult at the school who appears to have his back. We also see evidence of faith in God as a healer, as Sister Eve reminds Odie more than once when he gives her credit for healing people at the tent revivals. While Eve has a rather sketchy business partner in Sid, she remains a light and comfort to the vagabonds through the time that they are with her on their journey, and later as a guardian and friend to Emmy. Each of the four children has different moments of grappling with and or realizations about God and his, his her presence and influence in the course of their young lives. Okay, the next slide, please. The music inspired by this Tenderland. Well, we, um, I was so fascinated on, on his website when I found out that there was a playlist on Spotify where you can actually go on and listen to the music. There are um, 21 different songs that are, um, that are mentioned throughout the book. And on his website, Kruger has um, the page numbers listed next to the songs. So um, if you, and the one that we would listen to at the beginning down by the riverside is one of the songs, although we had a lovely spirited rendition of it that we heard, that we heard tonight. Um, but the tent revivals were held in various parts of the country during this time with music being a prominent part of them. Sister Eve's singing talents, accompanied by her horn player and pianist, drew Odie's attention one evening when he was camped along the river. And he played his harmonica along with the distant strains of Embraceable You, a Gershwin song that, Od that Odie knew. Um, here is what, what Kruger says about the music that's included in the story. This Tenderland playlist reflects the crucial role of music in the novel. Songs narrate Odie's journey. Odie is a musician himself, and both the playing of and listening to music became key methods for Odie and his companions to connect with the important characters they meet during their travels. From Odie playing his harmonica and comforting Mose with a tune while in the quiet room at the Lincoln School, to his serenading the drunken pig scarer in his barn from the call of the spiritual being performed at Sister Eve's tent revival to a, to a campfire jam session in Hoperville. So um, do dip into the music. I think that you will enjoy making the connection. And um, this was also from the website, the harmonica notes for Shenandoah. If any of you are harmonica players, you can, um, you can play along with Odie on this one. Then um, I ask in the next one, I ask you this question. The next slide, what is the role of music in this story? How does its inclusion enhance the story? So that might be a possible jumping off point for you in your discussions. To me, it adds appreciation for the role of music in our history and how it reflects the times and culture. And of course, most important, it gives us a sense of connection with other people in our story. Next slide. So what is in a name? 
I, I took this picture a couple of years ago when I was waiting for the fireworks to begin on the 4th of July. I was down in the harbor in Duluth and I saw this long string of Canada geese go across the bay. And um, I kind of chuckled and I thought, well, like what, what visual could I use for what is in a name? And I thought, I don't know if mama or papa goose at the end of that line, but if one of the little geese gets out of line, does he or she have a name? So I ask you about our story. How well do the names of the characters in this story fit them? How do they help you visualize each person? And here I'm just going to go through a brief list of, of some of the names. Of course, we have Odie, who is short for Odysseus from Homer's The Odyssey. He also took on the name Buck Jones. Um, we have Emmy, who did not take on another name, short for Emmeline. The, bo the boys were always nervous. People, people were going to find out who she was. And then Mose, who didn't speak, his Indian name was Amdacha. And in English, that is broken in pieces. Then we had Sister Eve, Sid, Whisker the Piano Man. And of course, just the very name of their crusade, the Sword of Gideon Healing Crusade, tells you much. We have Albert, Thelma, Thelma Brickman, the Black Witch, and then Clyde Brickman, her somewhat softer husband the German man Volt, who, who really did look after the children. DiMarco, the one they all feared. And then Gertie, the woman they meet at the flats in St. Paul who has a little restaurant and she's really kind of the mother of everybody. She feeds people and takes care of them. She even delivers babies when she needs to. Um, and one of the boys named John Kelly, which is of course not his real name, and then this one is, is really graphic and descriptive, the rattlesnake's name, Lucifer. And we have the river Gilead, which has all sorts of biblical con connotations as well. So have some fun thinking about what is in a name in, in, this, in this particular story. Um, okay, the next, the next slide I, I wrote above it, the search for home. This is actually an old railroad bridge here in Duluth. It goes across the St. Louis River, which empties into um, the Bay of Lake Superior. And this bridge actually ends right where the tree where the tree is on the right side of the screen. They cut off what was there because it's no longer in use. There's a big modern bridge very nearby. Uh, but I, I was down there very early one morning and took pictures of this structure. And it just made me made me think about Odie riding the rails all the way from St. Paul to St. Louis. And I think it took about three days as, as I recall from the story. But since our protagonist Odysseus O'Banion is on a quest to return to the only family he knows, Aunt Julia in St. Louis, we have a theme of longing for home threaded through the story. Odie goes to all lengths to find Julia and as we learn near the end of the story, there is more to his family than he has ever known. For me, one of the joys of preparing for a book talk such as this one is the many directions my research takes me. And one of my discoveries in thinking about this theme of looking for or going home was my discovery in one of my files of a New York Times essay by their op-ed columnist, David Brooks. And this was several years ago and he was reporting on a TEDx talk that was given by the British singer Sting, in which Sting talked about the renewing power of going home. And how thinking about his childhood in the north of England revitalized his creative powers to write songs in a time when he felt that his creative powers had dried up. And so Brooks reflected in this essay, historical consciousness has the, full the fullness of paradox that future imagination cannot match. When we think of the past, we think about things that seemed bad at the time, but turned out to be good in the long run. 
We think about the little things that seemed inconsequential at the moment, but made all the difference. Going back is a creative process. Robert Frost's famous poem about the two paths diverging in the woods isn't only about the two paths. It also describes how older people go back in memory and impose narrative order on choices that didn't seem so clear at the time. The process of going home is also reorienting. Life has a way of blowing you off course. People have a way of forgetting what they originally set out to do. Going back means recapturing the original aspirations. And that's the end of um, Brooks's comment. Isn't this what Kruger has done by making our narrator, Odie, an old man, looking back on his childhood? He also shows us Odie's life on the cusp of growing up with its angst, anger, hopes, and dreams. He gives both youth and old age a presence, finds peace with the God question. And he tells us in the epilogue, Next slide. There is a river that runs through time and the universe, vast and inexplicable. He goes on to say, a flow of spirit that is at the heart of all existence and every molecule of our being is part of it. And what is God but the whole of that river? So river as a metaphor for God. And then he goes on to say, um, through Odie as an old man. When I look back at the summer of 1932, I see a boy not quite 13, doing his best to pin down God, to corral that river and give it a form he could understand. Like so many before him, he's shaped it and reshaped it and shaped it again. And yet it continued to, to defy all his logic. I would love to be able to call out to him and tell him in a kindly way that reason will do him no good, that it is pointless to rail about the difficulty of the twists in that river and that he shouldn't worry about where the current will take him. Thank you. But I confess that even more than 80 years after even more than 80 years of living, I still struggle to understand what I know in my heart is a mystery beyond human comprehension. Perhaps the most important truth I've learned across the whole of my life is that it's only when I yield to the river and embrace the journey that I find peace. And um, I'm not going to read you the quote, but I'll just quickly summarize before we go into this, um, this final slide that when they start down the river and Emmy is, is still um, fresh from losing her mother, she's grieving and she's crying in Moses' arms. And he continues to tap into her hand the message, not alone, not alone. And to me, that was just, that's on page 165. And it's one of the most poignant, poignant descriptions in the book, that sense, not alone. And, um, and I think whatever you want to call, you know, like that greater spirit, you know, the God spirit or the God of the tornado God or whatever, that the characters are searching throughout this whole story. And Moe seems to understand not alone. So that, that was just rather touching to me. Um, but in this, the rose in bloom at the end is because um, I like to think about the blend of fiction and truth that we find in this story. It is set in historical context of the Great Depression. In places along rivers you can find on a map. And yet Kruger's own description of what he has given us best sums it up. He says, in every good tale, there is a seed of truth. And from that seed, a lovely story grows. Some of what I've told you is true. And some, well, let's just call it the bloom on the rose bush. Thank you.
Okay, thank you. What's fun to see all of you in the breakout rooms. Of course, we got some of us got to cut off mid sentence so you can just fill in the blanks. Um, I just have a couple more comments to make as, as in a way of closing. Um, who knew that what looked like it would be a simple adventure story of a band of orphans seeking home and safety would also pique our curiosity about the larger issue of who or what is God and how does this presence influence my life or what comprises a family? Kruger says, I wanted to write a story about the beauty of the human spirit, what I believe to be its capacity for resilience and for remarkable generosity in the face of great privation. The depression with its challenges and hardships on such a massive scale seemed the perfect backdrop for such a story. So the beauty of the human spirit Resilience, remarkable generosity in the face of privation. For these three reasons alone, this story is worth our time and thought. Sometimes storytelling can make us laugh or cry or just ache inside. But if it is laced with hope, it can lift us out of ourselves with a little more love and compassion for others. Open yourself to every possibility. You don't know where it will lead you. I hope reading This Tender Land does this for you. When you open yourself to every possibility, Kruger tells us, there is nothing your heart can imagine that is not so. Thank you all for being with us today. Well, thank you so much, Linda, and thank you all for Joining us on behalf of the alumni and field relations and lifelong learning team, we're so grateful that you joined us for this virtual event. We look forward to seeing your pie photos from <laughs> July 1st through the 5th. We're going to take July off from the book club, but stay tuned to hear about our next book club pick. So thank you all so much and have a wonderful evening. I'm gonna lay down my sword and shield Down by the riverside Down by the riverside Down by the riverside I'm gonna lay down my sword and shield Down by the riverside Down by the riverside